Well, I, uh, I just want you to know, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I just want you to know how glad I am to be here with you today. I've been looking forward to this for some time. I haven't preached in two months. And uh, I know a lot of you have been praying for me, and God is answering prayer. I am getting better. I know I'm in a wheelchair right now, and you think it's getting worse. It's not getting worse. The reason I'm in a wheelchair, there's really three reasons. One, it's a little more convenient for me because I, I still have a difficult time standing for an entire message or whatever. I get lightheaded sometimes. And, um, and then uh, another reason is you could not see my nice socks if, uh, if I were not sitting in this chair. And, uh, but really one of the real reasons, I've done a funeral and a wedding the last few weeks, and because I've lost so much weight, my pants will not stay up. And I do not want to moon you while I'm preaching on stage. That would be that would be discouraging, okay? I would just say that. That would be discouraging. I see some of you, you don't need to agree so readily, all right? So, but uh, the fact is, I am so thrilled to be back. I'm so happy uh, to see you. Those of you that join us online, I'm very, very excited about what God is doing in our church. And uh, so, we're really excited about what uh, the next few months holds. And so, I just want to say Thank you for being here with us today. God bless you. And I hope we're going to have a great, great service today. It's already been fantastic, hasn't it? Man, I enjoyed the worship so much. Just absolutely fantastic. I need to get near this little table here. So, uh, But uh, anyway, let me, let me just say this. They wanted me to talk about the miracle offering. Uh, the miracle offering is coming up December the 6th. How many know what the miracle offering is? You've heard of that before. Raise your hand. How many of you are new to our church and you don't know what the miracle offering is? Anybody like that? Okay, most everybody knows what it is, all right? So don't need to spend a whole lot of time. But the miracle offering, we do it every year. It is an offering where we sow a seed in faith. You're not buying a blessing, but you're asking God in faith uh, to answer your prayer. We do it every year. Kim and I have done it every year that we've taken the miracle offering. And we pray every year for a miracle in our life. We pray for a miracle in other people's lives. And so that's what the miracle offering is. It is an offering of thanksgiving. It is an offering of blessing. It is an offering where we ask God uh, to do miracles in our church and in our lives. You may be praying for a, a lost loved one to be saved. You may be praying about a job. Maybe you don't have a job right now. Maybe you lost your job during uh, this pandemic and you need a real breakthrough. Others, maybe your need is in your family. Maybe it's with your kids, or maybe it's with your spouse, or maybe it's with your parents or a relative. Uh, whatever it is, we know that God answers prayer. And so this miracle offering does a couple things. One, it positions us to be able to receive a blessing from God. And number two, it empowers our church to go forward in ministry. Because we use this for ministry as well, and countless numbers of people have been saved because of the faithfulness of the giving of people here at Avalon Church. Uh, the, the, the number of families that have been impacted, uh, we don't even know how many. And so it's because of this. And so this is why we ask you to give. So that is December the 6th that the miracle offering uh, will be taking place. So I hope you'll participate in that and be praying uh, about that. Well, I want to do a brief update. Uh, those of you that have been coming, you know that I... Uh, Kim and I went down to the uh, Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, the main thing that they figured out was that they need to get some more money out of my bank account and uh, have me to come back and do about four or five more things that I've already had done, all right? So, uh, but joking aside, they're asking me to do another couple of MRIs and meet with their neurologist. The good news is I'm getting better with my pain. Um, God is healing me in that. It's a process. I'm still not quite able to walk like I was, but I, I don't believe it'll be too much longer before I'm back 100%. Thank you so much uh, for praying for me during that time. Now, I wanted to, I wanted to kind of use this as an illustration. Um, the fact is, you look at this wheelchair and you ask, what's the deal with this? Well, when I look at this, the, the first thing that I think about this wheelchair um, is that it's simply a tool. That's all it is. It's a tool to get me to the point where I need to be. 
Do you know that where we are right now in this pandemic panic that our nation is in, that our world is in, God is still in control. Do you believe that? Do you believe that, church? Some of you do. Some of you are not sure yet. God is in control. And here's the thing. What God does, we don't always understand, but he uses as a tool uh, to get us to where we need to be. And so the fact is, uh, God uses, uh, just like he uses this wheelchair, he will use the situation that we're in in our nation, the situation we're in in our church. He's not caught by surprise. Uh, you can guarantee that God has not been biting his fingernails because he's nervous of what's going on uh, with COVID-19. But rather, this is simply a tool, and though we may not understand it all yet, if we keep our eyes focused on him and we're patient, we'll see that God uses this tool to bring glory to his name. The second thing that I believe it is, is it's simply transitional. We are in a transition. This, this wheelchair is like a transition for me, transition to where I can start running again, and I can't wait for that. But here's the point, and you and I don't need to miss this. God puts us through transitions often that we don't understand. And so when we, as a church, we begin to see what God is doing in our nation and in our community, and sometimes we get scared, and sometimes we get nervous, and sometimes we're impatient. How many are on the impatient train? I am. But the fact is, God uses transitions in our lives. And the thing that I'm most excited about, though, with this wheelchair, is it's temporary. It is simply something that I have to wait for a little bit. Completely temporary. You say, how do you know? Well, because either I'm going to be healed or I'm going to be taken to heaven. Either way, I get rid of the wheelchair, all right? And the point is this, don't miss this. Uh, a lot of times when we uh, as believers, we begin to look at the stuff around us and we begin to look at all the problems that we're facing and the fears that we have, we forget that it's just temporary. All of the things that you're going through right now, maybe you've lost a job, maybe you've gotten sick, maybe you've even lost a friend or a family member to COVID-19. All of this, everything that we are going through is temporary and we need to realize that God uh, is on the throne and that when we keep our eyes on him, everything's going to be okay. Amen? Amen, church? Do we believe this today? Come on, we can do better than that. Do we believe this today? Well, so what do you do during a time of pandemic? Well, we've talked about that a lot. But I believe that we need to talk about what to do during a time of uncertainty. We are still living in a time of uncertainty. I wish that we had everything cured, everything had an answer to it, but it doesn't yet. We've got to be patient. We've got to trust God. We've got to believe that he is still in control. So what do you do? How do you have confidence in a time of uncertainty? Well, I'll read to you from the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians was a letter written to a real live church in a real life place called Philippi, thus the book of Philippians, the letter that the apostle Paul wrote. He wrote it to real Christians. They were in a real church. Um, it would, they were a real congregation just like we are a real congregation, okay? And they were having difficulty they, you could say that they were in transition as well. And what Paul wrote to them about was how to live, how to have faith in a time of uncertainty. And, and, and he showed them that the way to do this is, is pretty simple, but it's sometimes pretty difficult. The entire book of Philippians is about Jesus Christ giving us joy. When we follow him, when we look at what he has done for us, when we realize the blessings that he has brought in our life, and when we have faith to trust him, then we can have joy. And we can have joy even during the time of a pandemic. Let me read to you beginning in chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. He says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit 
with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. Now, you can see there that they were in a time of uncertainty. They didn't know if Paul was coming or not. They didn't know what it was going to be like if he got there or if he didn't. And he told them, he said, there are three things that we've got to do. And I want to say this to our church members watching online. I want to challenge you. Don't let these times that you're watching online become secondary. Really easy, really easy to, you know, I'm making breakfast and I'm going to make lunch and I'm, oh, the, the service is on. I'm going to run out real quick uh, while they're singing. And it's really easy to treat it like it's not a real service. But I want to challenge you, treat it as it is. Because it is, and we have people joining us all over the world. But this is serious because this is the church. And so I want to challenge you that you be involved. Don't let it slip by. Make sure that you're faithful. Give, serve, participate, sing, worship, be a part of a service just as if you are here. And I want to challenge you just as soon as you possibly can, come back in person because you're going to enjoy it. You're going to love it, and it's going to be a blessing to you. What three things did Paul tell the church there? And I say this not just to our church, but to churches all across this world, all across this state, all across this region. We collectively as the church need to do these three things. He told them, number one, they need to be faithful. Even during a time of uncertainty, be faithful. Church, we must be faithful. Not just Avalon Church, but churches all across this region and all across this world. Now is not a time to coast. Now is not a time to let our foot off the pedal. Now is a time to be faithful. Be faithful in worship. Be faithful in serving. Be faithful in prayer. Be faithful in giving. Be faithful in uh, serving the Lord with your life. Now is a time to be faithful. Second thing he challenged them to do was to be unified. He said there, stand firm in one spirit. Stand firm in one spirit. That's unity. As the church, we during this time, I really believe this is an opportunity for churches that major on the minors to start majoring on the majors. You see, so many churches, we, we major on things that are not really that important. Uh, as churches collectively Often, we're known for what we hate rather than what we love. And that's not what God has called the church to be. We are to be unified. We as a church are to be unified in the love of Christ. We are to give the love of Christ to others. Why? Because this is what God has called us to do. Oh, yes, we realize that there's some distinctives to Christianity. It is about Jesus Christ. It is about faith alone and Christ alone. We get that. But the style of music that we employ or the uh, style of service that we have, these are secondary. These are unimportant things. As a church worldwide, we must be unified. What are we unified around? The gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our unifying call. That's our clarion call. That's what keeps us going. We're to have unity. And then the third thing is that we're to have boldness. Now is the time to be bold. He said, don't be afraid of anything that your opponents bring into your path. Be bold. Now is the time to act in faith. Be bold. That is the, the call that God has given to us collectively as the church worldwide. What about, though, for Avalon Church? What is God calling us specifically to do? Well, I believe that he wants us to be faithful, and I believe he wants us to be unified, and I believe he wants us to be bold during this time. But I believe there are some other things that we do during a time of uncertainty that will help us do these things that God has challenged us to do. Pick up reading with me in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord most of the time. That's not what he said, is it? Rejoice in the Lord always. Even when the washing machine breaks down. You ever notice that stuff don't break down when it's convenient time? You ever notice that? It never is convenient, is it? He said rejoice in the Lord always. If you're having a difficult time, rejoice in the Lord. If you're sick and tired of this pandemic and can't wait for it all to be behind us, rejoice in the Lord. That's what 
Paul says we are to rejoice in the Lord. He says, and again I will say, rejoice. In case you missed it the first time, rejoice. He said, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. My, could we not use a little bit more of that in our culture right now? I, in my lifetime, I'm 56 years old, I don't believe I've ever seen more unreasonableness than I have at this time in my life. There's just a lot of things that are, un I realize sometimes as you get older, there are some things that seem unreasonable uh, that young people do, and you're like, that is totally unreasonable. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the kind of unreasonableness that rejects Christ, that does not have the gospel at its core and at its center. He says, be reasonable. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and mind, minds in Christ Jesus. What specifically does God want us to do as a church? We've got the big picture. We need to be faithful. We need to have unity. We need to be bold. But I believe as a church, one thing we must practice, what he talked about here, we must develop an attitude of gratitude. Develop an attitude of gratitude. When you are thankful, when you rejoice, not only do you receive more joy, not only are you happier, not only are your circumstances more reasonable, but you are a testimony to others. You are a light because of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that others can find hope. He says, be thankful. Rejoice. Develop an attitude of gratitude. Notice there are three things that we do on a consistent basis that will help us have more gratitude. It's right here in this text we just read. Let's look at them. Number one is praise. You need to praise God. He says we're to rejoice and praise God for everything. Now, it's, it's easy to praise God when things are good. It's easy to praise God when your favorite football team comes back from 21 points down like the Tar Heels did yesterday, right? That's easy to say, thank God, praise God, you know. It's easy to thank God when the Falcons are up 28 to 3 in the Super Bowl. It's hard to praise God when they lose in overtime. You know what I mean? Anybody still bitter? All right, anybody? God, I hate the Patriots. All right, so anyway, uh, I know I'm supposed to love everybody, but, you know, there are exceptions. You know what I'm saying? So, um, but the, the point is, he says we're to praise him and when I begin to do that, it makes me see things differently. You know, it's, it's easy to just grumble and complain about having a flat tire. But when you stop and say, well, you know what? I've got a lot to praise God for because I have a car, and that puts me in the top 10% of the wealthiest people in the world, and God has blessed me. Maybe I should be thankful. You see how that does? It relieves stress. We need to praise God. Number two, we need to pray. He said we're to pray always and about everything. We are to pray. I believe that often as believers we resort to prayer last. When God says we need to resort to it first. You want to develop a grateful attitude. You want to be more thankful. You want to have more joy. You want to have more peace. You want to be able to recognize the blessings in your life. Praise God. Praise Him at church. Praise Him online. Praise Him by going to work. Praise Him in whatever you do. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Praise Him. The more I praise Him, the more I pray, the more thankful I am, the more I'm able gonna, gonna be able to serve Him, the more I'm going to be able to handle the stress that comes from the unknown. And then the third thing is just rest in His peace. He says that He gives us the peace that passes understanding. Do you know that God gives peace that passes understanding? Y'all are watching me of how good I, I man, manage this thing. I can tell that. I, I, this is the first time I've ever sat in a wheelchair, okay? So if I, if I mess up, it's your fault for not praising God enough. All right, so uh, you're not living in the peace of God. 
No, he says the peace of God passes all understanding. Now, I wonder if you've had that. Have you been able to look at this pandemic that we're in? Have you been able to look at the fact that maybe your job has slowed down? Have you been able to look at the fact that maybe you're frustrated because you can't go out in public like you normally do or do what you normally do? Have you been able to recognize and rest in the peace of God? Are you walking around frustrated as you possibly can be? You know, I hope you voted and I hope you're involved politically. But I got some news for you. It don't matter who's in the White House. Now, you should vote. Don't get me wrong. You should vote your conscience. I believe you should vote biblically, okay? But listen, it don't matter who's in the White House. It matters who's in God's house. That's what matters, okay? It doesn't matter who's controlling the Congress because we know who controls it all, amen? And it's Jesus Christ. And he is, you know, you can say, well... We need a better political system. We're going to get it one day when King Jesus comes again and he sets up his rule and his reign and you're not going to have to worry about it anymore. Thank God I'm looking forward to that day because I sure do get sick and tired of seeing it online. All right, so. But do you have the peace of God that passes understanding? Well, let's look at the next thing he said to do. Verse 8, he said, Finally, brothers... And sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. That brings us to the second thing as a church we need to do in order to help us to be bold, to be faithful, to have unity. you got to direct your thinking with a purpose. You know what he says there? You can control your thinking. Garbage in, garbage out. He said, if you want to be angry and frustrated and just kind of feel like that everything's going wrong, just fill your mind with garbage. He said, if there's anything good, lovely, commendable, excellent, think on those things. So when you feel down, when you feel like that you can't handle it anymore, turn off the television or the internet, or Facebook, and begin to think about the Word of God and the promises of God and the blessings of God, and it will control your thinking. You'll direct it, and you'll be better off because of the way that you think. Then in verse 11, he said, Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. By the way, in the context here, so you'll know, these few verses, he's talking about money. He's talking about that there were times that he had all he needed and more, and there were times he went hungry. Okay? Because, you know, this verse that we read, a lot of times we take it out of context. And I don't believe that it's bad to apply this verse we're getting ready to read uh, to show that God will help you through. But don't forget, it doesn't always mean that your Christian high school football team is going to win on Friday night. Okay? Because, by the way, I've often wondered, how do you come to that conclusion? How does God choose between two Christian school football teams? I mean, who does he choose? Who does he like better? Whose prayer does he answer? So I don't think this is really what he's talking about. But he said, I know how to be brought low and how to abound in any and every circumstance. I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Which brings me to that third thought. You've got to cultivate contentment. You say, what does that mean? Well, he said that no matter what circumstance financially he finds himself in, he rests in the Lord. And, and i got to be honest. I believe in tithing and I believe in giving and I believe that God blesses those who do. I'm not a prosperity gospel preacher by any stretch of the imagination uh, because I do not believe just because you tithe that you're become a, going to become a millionaire. That's not. In fact, one of the worst things that God could do for some of you is make you rich. No, I, I'm, I'm very serious about that. Because... There are some people that cannot handle that. There are some people that get rich. I've seen it happen so many times. They just drop out of church. They stop doing what they 
should be doing to serve God, to use their gift for him, and they just kind of quit on the Lord and their relationship with the Lord. So Paul said, I have learned in every circumstance to be content. Why? Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And church, I want you to know that in this pandemic, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Maybe you lost your job. Paul learned to be content. It doesn't mean that you should never have a goal or try to improve or get a raise or if you are so inclined to get a beach house. That is not what it means, okay? What it means is that we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ and we cultivate contentment because we know that he is the one that is in charge. And he is the one that blesses us. And he is the one that supplies our need. And then finally, the last verse, verse 19, and I love this verse. He's talking about controlling our thinking, praising God, learning how to be content, how to live our life not out of fear, but out of resting in God's grace. All these wonderful things. He's saying, this is what we do. This is how we do it. This is so important. And then I love this verse. It kind of wraps up this section of the book of Philippians. And he said, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Let me just break down that verse real quickly. My God. How many are glad that we have a God that is a personal God that knows us? My God will, not might, not as capable, not if he's in a good mood, he will. My God, when you have that personal relationship with God, my God will supply my every need. How many can say amen to that? Wait a minute. He didn't say our every greed. Once again, nothing wrong with wanting a new car as long as you're not covetous or greedy or envious. You can have 10 Rolls Royces and please God with your life. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It matters that we tithe, we give, we're generous, that it doesn't control us, okay? That we learn to live for the kingdom of God but he said he'll supply our needs. Look, I don't know why we're going through what we're going through, but evidently the church needs this. You see, that's weird. Yeah, I know. But the truth is, when we trust God, every one of our needs, he will supply. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? Well, he doesn't do it out of, but according to. Let me explain the difference in that. If you were to come to me and you had a financial need, and you said, Pastor, I need to borrow $100,000. I would pat you on the back and say, God bless you. We'll see you later. All right, so no. I'm praying for you. All right, I don't have $100,000 to give you. But let's just say that I had $10 million in the bank. I don't. But let's just say I did. And you came to me and you said, Pastor, I have a need. My children are hungry. We have no place to live. I don't know what we're going to do. And I looked at you and I said, I am going to help provide for you. And I'm going to give you out of my wealth. Now, you know that I had $10 million in the bank, and I can give you out of, I can give you $100,000 out of that $10 million. Why? Because I'm giving it to you out of, according, out of my wealth. But that's not what God does. He doesn't give you out of his wealth. He gives you according to his wealth. And if you came to me and said, Pastor, I need help, and I need help, you, if you will, to be a blessing to me. And I looked at you and I said, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to give you according to my wealth. That would mean that I would give you a blank check and I would sign it and up to $10 million. 
you would be able to have your needs met. Can I say this? God's got a whole lot more than $10 million. The Bible says that he owns it all. The Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The Bible tells us that God will be the one that owns everything, that Jesus Christ is in control and he owns everything. And when our God says that he will supply, it's not out of his riches, but it's according to that blank check of God's unimaginable wealth and God's unimaginable blessing in our life. That God says, I will meet your need. And when we begin to think this way, it begins to change our life. It begins to change the way we live during a pandemic. It begins to change the way that we look at life, doesn't it? And God wants us to be able to live in a way that we are being faithful, that we're unified as a church, and that we're bold. I believe now is the time for us to be bold. Now is the time for us not to let up, but to press forward. Now is the time for us not to worry, but to rejoice. Now is the time not for us to be angry or frustrated, but to praise God for all that he has done and to praise God that Jesus Christ is the one that gave his life for us. He stretched out his hands, his arms, his feet on a cross, and he died and he paid for our sins. He said, it is finished. And even though it seemed like for a little while that the king of glory was gone, that the light of the world had been snuffed out. He was buried. He was buried in a real tomb. But thank God, after three days, he woke up from that grave and he said, I've got this. And he conquered death and the grave. And he rose again. And he says that he is coming again one day. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about that, that gives me peace gives me hope, and it allows me to rest in the grace of God. I wonder, do you need prayer that way today? Joining us online, do you need prayer? Maybe today you need to pray to receive Christ as your Savior. I want to give you that opportunity. I know I didn't really talk about salvation, but the Bible is very clear. In order for us to be made right with God, we put our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. You don't trust in being a church member. You don't trust in being a good person. You don't trust in doing good deeds, but you trust in Jesus. And you say, well, I'd like to know how to do that. You pray something like this. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And whether you're here or joining us online, if you're here, fill out one of these cards and, and uh, drop it on the way out in one of the boxes. If you're online, fill out the next step card online that you prayed to receive Christ as your Savior. But pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose from the grave. And I'm asking you right now to save me. I don't understand it all. I don't know everything about the Bible, but I do trust you, and I'm trusting you to come into my life and to save me. God promised that he would. And then I wonder if there are those that are still a little worried about the pandemic panic. You're still uncertain what to do during times like this. And you would say, you know what? I need to take that challenge today. Maybe your challenge is faithfulness. You need to read the Bible more. Pray again. Come back to church. Be faithful to watch online. You need to be faithful. For others, maybe it's unity. Maybe During this time, you've gotten crossways with somebody. Maybe you've gotten angry or upset with somebody. Now is the time to repent of that. Now is the time to confess that to God and make that right. Unity, the same goal of seeing people come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. Or maybe it's time for you to be bold. Maybe it's time for you to take that step. Maybe it's time for you to come back. Maybe it's time for you to be bold in an initiative that God has laid on your heart and you're afraid of it. But God is calling you to step out in faith. Whatever it is, be bold and don't shy away from it. How many would say, Pastor, I need prayer in one of those areas in my life, and I want you to pray with me right now. Would you raise your hand? A lot of people, most people. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for those that are being saved today. Thank you for those that are committing their life to you today. 
Thank you for those that are making a decision about being bold and having faith and, and living a faithful life and being unified as a church. I pray that you bless us. Thank you for every person here. Bless us this week as we go about our way. Help us, Lord, to trust in you. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray and ask all these things. Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord a praise this morning today? Thank him for all he's done. Wow, we have a lot to be thankful for. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.